Welcome everybody to the IMSC Algebraic Combinatoric Seminar. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Volodymyr Vazurchuk from Uppsala University. And uh, he's going to talk about uh, well, category O, uh, Bigrasmanian permutations and Verma modules. Uh, Walter, please. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for this kind of invitation. I already did something wrong. <clears throat> thanks a lot for this invitation. It's a pleasure to give a talk here. So I'm going to talk uh, about Bigrasmanian permutations and Verma modules, and uh, the subject seems to fit very nicely in the title of the seminar. So it's algebraic combinatorics. It's a combinatorial result for an algebraic object. So I will at least define the algebraic objects, but I will not go into deep uh, algebraic details. So my aim is uh, to, to try to present the combinatorics behind the algebraic uh, situation without going into too heavy details. And I would like to start with saying that everything what I'm going to talk about uh, is a joint work with uh, Han Kyun Ko and Rafael Mjen, uh, both are postdocs here at Uppsala. Okay, so I'm going to talk about category O. Uh, so I will at least define the objects without going into the details and then present the combinatorial uh, description of the structure which is uh, uh, which is relevant for today <clears throat> so through the so it, during the talk uh, i will work with category o for the special linear Lie algebra sln of traceless n times n matrices over the complex numbers. And to define the category O, we need to fix as the standard triangular decomposition of this algebra. So it's the decomposition of SLN into N minus plus H plus N plus, it should be N plus. So H is the Cartan subalgebra of diagonal matrices, N plus should be the the algebra of all strictly upper triangular matrices, it's nilpotent, and N minus is the Lie algebra of all strictly lower triangular matrices. So in particular, we fix a Cartan subalgebra of SLN, and this immediately says that we have the wild group of SLN, which is well known to be isomorphic to the symmetric group SN. So this is a reflection group acting on the dual space of the Cartan, where the action is generated by simple reflections uh, with respect to these roots of the Lie algebra. And when we have fixed this triangular decomposition, we can talk about the bernstein gilfand gilfand category O, which is defined in the following way. So this is a category of all G modules, the full subcategory in the category of all G modules, which consists of all modules that are finitely generated, that are H diagonalizable. It means that any element of the Cartan subalgebra acts on this module in a semi-simple way. In other words, such that there is an eigenbasis for, for this action. And then uh, the third condition is that these modules uh, should be U and plus locally finite. This means if you take an element in the module and add act on it by the universal enveloping algebra of the positive part, the outcome will be a finite dimensional vector space. But the module itself, it doesn't have to be finite dimensional and almost all modules in category O are infinite dimensional. Also by definition, category O contains the category of all finite dimensional G modules. So it's in some sense a generalization of the latter. later. And I will be mostly concerned about the so-called principal block O0 of the category O. So the point of category O is that it's a very big category. So simple objects in O are exactly simple highest weight modules, and they are indexed by the, the elements in the dual space to the Cartan. So in particular, there are infinitely many 
simple high straight modules, a continuum many. So it's, it's a very big category. And I want to make a situation in some sense finite dimensional. So category O decomposes into blocks given let's say roughly speaking by the action of the center. So if you fix uh, the central character, then you have the, the corresponding direct summand of category O and that direct summand now contains only finitely many simple objects. So it's a much smaller category. And the block O0, this is a direct summand of category O which contains a trivial G module. So if you take as a central character, the central character of the trivial one dimensional G module, then you have the associated direct summand of category O denoted O0. And this is the main protagonist, uh, the main object which we will look at during the talk. And the main fact about it is now that this category is much more manageable. It is equivalent to the category of, more, of finite dimensional modules over a certain finite dimensional associative algebra. So if you assume that this algebra is basic, then it's even uniquely defined up to isomorphism. So this category O0 is a nice module category over a finite dimensional associative algebra. Next, I want to tell a little bit about the combina elementary combinatorics associated to this block. So simple objects in this block are in bijection with elements in the while group. And the bijection is, uh, I wrote here this bijection just to, just to fix the notation. The element W in the while group corresponds to the simple module LW, and this is a simple highest weight module with highest weight W dot zero. So there is a shifted action of the while group, which is called the dot action. And to get the highest weight of that module, we should apply W to the zero weight under the dot action. And then this simple highest weight module LW has a Verma cover which is usually denoted delta W. So this is the universal highest weight module with this particular highest weight W dot zero. And it's a nice connection to India. So these modules were first studied by Verma in his PhD thesis somewhere in the late 60s, I believe. So approximately 50 years ago. And now I want to present the basic combinatorial facts about Verma modules. So consider the Bruja order on the while group. So the basic combinatorial facts about Verma modules are given by the following theorem, which is due to Bernstein, Gilfan, Gilfan from early 70s, usually called the BGG structure theorem for Verma modules. And it says the following. So if we fix two elements in the while group, then the following conditions are equivalent. The first condition is that the simple Ly appears as a composition subquotient of the Verma module delta x. The second condition is that y is Bruja greater than or equal to than x. And the last condition is that Verma module delta y is actually a submodule of the Verma module delta x. So inclusions of Verma modules are given exactly by the Bruja order in the while group. And also some additional information. So these inclusions are in fact unique. So dimension of the home space between two Verma modules is at most one and any non-zero homomorphism is injected. So is exactly as any non-zero homomorphism is the one appearing in the, in the structure series. So Bricha order defines the basic combinatorics of the uh, inclusions between Verma modules and also defines the composition subquotients which appear in Verma modules. Great, so now I want to talk a little bit about the original motivation for these results. So as usually I denote by W0 the longest element in W. So in uh, June this year, I got an email from uh, Matthias Strauch, 
with the following question. So the question was motivated by his uh, joint work with Sasha Orlov. So he asked me whether there exist two elements X and Y in W, which are Bruja related, and such that the first extension from the quotient of delta Y by delta W zero to delta X is non-zero. Note that W zero is Bruja greater than anything. So by the previous theorem, delta W zero is a submodule of any Verma module. So this motivates this factoring the delta y by it's actually the simple circle of delta y so the question was whether such extension is possible and the point is it under these conditions that x and y are briefly related and uh, so they did the computations in small ranks and in ranks up to two the answer was no and it took me approximately one week to come up with a counter example so with an example which they didn't want uh, for SL4. And so the point is that for SL4, if you look, uh, if you look at the Dinkin diagram and uh, number the simple roots in this way, then using some techniques from category O, you can show that the first extension from this quotient to this element is non-zero and uh, the element s the simple reflection s is bruja smaller than the element s w zero so this is exactly what they didn't want to happen but you can construct it in the algebraic way and the small remark if you think about this example is that actually this quotient in the first variable is the simple module, it's the simple head of this Verma module delta S W zero. So then I kind of naturally asked myself the question, can we describe the first X from a simple module to a Verma module? So this is just a small generalization of this observation. And uh, so this was for me a natural question because I thought about this uh, some time ago and I knew one uh, special case and this was exactly one special case which was excluded by the previous question so if we denote by uh, so in the while group we have the usual length function so for each element w the length of w is the number of is the length of the reduced decomposition of w so let's define the modified length function l overlined which just counts the number of different simple reflections which appear in, in the reduced word of W. So it's smaller than the length. I simply look at how many different reflections you have without their multiplicities in this word. And uh, the point is that uh, some time ago I have shown that, sorry, that if you look at the extensions from this simple module LW0, this is the the one which is which is also the verma module so this is a unique simple verma module then the first x from this module to delta x is given by this function l overlined it's the number of simple reflections in the of different simple reflections in the reduced expression of w0 times x so this i know this i knew a long time ago but this is exactly what was excluded by this question because they were not interested in lw0 they were exactly interested in everything else so um, it, algebraically it's very easy to see that if you have any other simple reflect uh, simple module ly not lw0 but any other ly then any non-split then any non-split extension from ly to delta x so any such non-split extension is realizable as a submodule of the verma module delta e and so the questions above can be reformulated naturally can we describe the circle of the quotient of the verma module delta e by the verma module delta x so somehow the thinking about the previous questions naturally led to this reformulation we have any verma module is by bgg structure theorem a submodule of delta e 
So we can take the, and, and more, moreover, submodule in a unique way. There is a unique submodule of delta E isomorphic to delta X. So we take the quotient, can we describe the circle? This is the content of this. So answer to this question is the content of today's talk. Okay, so now let's go, uh, we need the, in order, the answer is very combinatorial, but in order to prepare for this answer, I, I need to go through some algebraic stuff, but um, it will be now a mixture of algebra and combinatorics. And in order to formulate the answer, I need to re recall a little bit the Hecke algebra combinatorics. So we have the Hecke algebra associated to our while group, and this is an associative algebra over the ring of Laurent polynomials in a variable V. And it is generated by elements HS, where S is a simple reflection, subject to the following relations. So we have the usual braid relations, and then the quadratic relation S square is equal to one is deformed to the relation HS plus V times HS minus V inverse is equal to one. So if you plug in V is equal to one, you get back your relation HS square is equal to one. So you get back the relation of the while group. So the Hecke algebra has a standard basis. If you take an element in the while group and consider its reduced expression, so you can multiply the generators H according to this reduced expression and you get the element HW. And because of a standard fact that any reduced expression can be reduced to any other reduced expression using braid relations, and the fact that we assume that generators satisfy the braid relations, we have that these elements HW are well defined for, for any W. They don't depend really on the choice of the reduced expression. The Hecke algebra has a certain involutive automorphisms called the bar involution, which is uniquely defined by the properties that the variable V, when we apply the bar involution to it, we get the inverse and that the involution applied to HS gives the inverse of HS for any simple reflection S. And then the famous result by Kajdan and Lustig says that the Hecke algebra has a Kajdan Lustig basis. And this is the basis defined in the following way. So for each element in the while group, there is a unique element HW underlined in the Hecke algebra which has the following two properties. First of all, it's self-dual with respect to the bar involution. And second is that when we write this as a linear combination of elements in the standard basis, we get HW on the nodes with coefficient one, and then plus a linear combination of other standard basis elements, including possibly HW, but now with coefficients which are polynomials in V without constant term. And such HW underline is unique. So these two properties define it uniquely. And the corresponding, the corresponding uh, coefficients in the transformation matrix from the standard basis to the kajdan lustig basis are usually called kajdan lustig polynomials. And the relevance of them to category O is given by the kajdan lustig conjecture, which was proved by Bailin Sonbernstein and Brilinski Kashivara uh, in early 80s. The conjecture itself was published in 79. So if you take the graded version of the Grotten D group of the category O0, so there is a canonical isomorphism of this Grotten D group with the Hecke algebra which sends the class of the Verma module delta W to the standard basis element HW. And the point of the conjecture is that this canonical isomorphism sends the class of the indecomposable projective cover of LW to the element in the kajdan lustig basis. So this is the relevance of this combinatorics to get it. Um, uh, excuse me, I have a 
small question. Can you clarify the role of V in the growth index group of category O? Um, uh, yes, so now I'm talking about the graded version of the uh, category O. So, so there, is a, uh, there is a Z cover of category O called the graded lift. And the role of V of the growth index group corresponds to the shift of grading. Okay, thank you. The multiplication with me, V corresponds to the shift of grading automorphism of the graded version of category O. If you, if you forget V, you will get the usual Groton D group, but then instead of the Hecke algebra, you will get the, uh, the group algebra, integral group ring of the uh, wild group. That is V equal to one. This is if V is equal to one, yes. Thanks. Okay, and this cushion linguistic sink is necessary to define cushion linguistic cells. So one consequence of cushion linguistic conjecture, but it was known before the conjecture was proved, it comes from the original paper of cushion linguistic, is that all coefficients of cushion linguistic polynomials are non-negative integers. And another consequence is the following fact that uh, moreover, all structure constants with respect to cushion linguistic basis are given by Laurent polynomials with non-negative coefficients. So the reason for that is that uh, there is some functorial action on category O by certain functors, which because of the cushion linguistic conjecture correspond exactly to the elements in the cushion linguistic basis. And so this product just describes the decomposition into the direct sum decomposition. There is a certain additive category of functors which acts on category O, such that in decomposable corresponds exactly to elements of the cushion linguistic basis. And because of that interpretation, the coefficients must be non-negative integers. <clears throat> And using this property, using the fact that these coefficients are non-negative integers, we can define what is known as kashdan linguistic pre-orders on the while group. So this says that the element W is left bigger than the element Y. If you can find an element X such that H underlying W appears in this product with a non-zero coefficient. So you can multiply Y on the left to get W as a summit. This is a left pre-order. The right pre-order is defined to use just uh, look at X, you, multi you, mul you multiply X on the right and you get W. So it's just the, the other definition. And J is the smallest pre-order which is generated by left and right. This is a two-sided order. It corresponds, you start with something, you, you are allowed to multiply on both sides and you get to a bigger element. And these are pre-orders, so these are not partial orders because some elements might be equivalent. So using these pre-orders, we can define kashdan linguistic cells. So the left cells are the equivalence classes with respect to the pre-order L. Right cells are equivalence classes with respect to the pre-order R. And two-sided cells are the equivalence classes with respect to the pre-order J. So this is, these are the definitions and in type A, these have very transparent uh, combinatorial interpretation. So recall that we have the robinson shenstedt correspondence. So if you have the symmetric group, then we have a robinson shenstedt map, which is a bijection between the symmetric group and the set of all pairs of standard Young tableaus of the same shape, where the shape is a partition of N. So, and if we denote, uh, just introduce the notation that the robinson shenstedt correspondent of W is the pair PW and QW of standard Young tableaus of certain shape, then Karsten Lustig showed in their paper that if you take the two elements X and Y in SN, then they are left equivalent if and only if the second component of the the second component of the robinson shenstedt correspondent coincide. They are right equivalent if the first component coincide, and they are two-sided equivalent if and only if the robinson shenstedt correspondents have the same shape. 
So this is a combinatorial description of Kajdan leucistic cells in type A. There is also a result by Gek, which says that the two-sided order in type A, so the, the elements, the two-sided cells are exactly the partitions and Gek proved that the two-sided order is exactly the dominance order on partitions. So in particular, we have the unique maximal element. So this is the unique maximal cell, which is the cell of the longest element in W. So this is a unique left, right, and two-sided cell, which is completely maximal. And if you take it out in what you get, you still have a unique maximal element, the new one. And this is the most important object for today. We call it the penultimate cell J. So this is the cell which consists of all elements whose robinson shenstedt correspondent have shape 2 comma 1 to the power n minus 2. So it's 2, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. This is a penultimate element, the penultimate element in the uh, in the dominance order. And it's very easy that this cell has n minus 1 to the power 2 elements, and both left and right cells are naturally indexed by simple reflections in it. So here are some examples. So in rank one, uh, we have the Dinkin diagram, which consists of one vertex. And the penultimate cell is the identity because W0 is just S. If you take it away, the penultimate cell will be the identity. So in rank two, we have the Dinkin diagram S and T connected by one H. So W0 is STS, TST. If you take it away, the penultimate cell is this one. It has S, TS, so, so these are the left cells. The left cells are columns and the right cells are uh, rows. And here is an example in rank three. So, so in rank two, we have two left cells and two right cells. And in rank three, our penultimate cell has three right cells and three left cells. And they all are naturally indexed by simple reflections it's 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 very clear directly from the picture okay so these are the examples and why is the cell important in our setup so our first principal observation is the following that if you have a simple module which appears in the circle of some quotient of the dominant verma delta e by delta w then the index of the simple module belongs to the penultimate cell J. So this is a combinatorial result, but it has a very non-combinatorial proof. So the proof uses uh, some manipulations with some derived functors. So we have a lot of alg algebraic machinery which we can use about category O, and there are many functors acting on it. And using some of them, you can prove this. It, it's not an easy statement, but it's true. Okay, so now in order to uh, go further into combinatorics, I need to recall some notions. So recall that we have the left ascent set for a permutation. So this is the set of all simple reflections such that if you multiply on the left, you get something which is bigger than your element. And of course you can define the right ascent set. Uh, similarly, you multiply on the right. And more or less from the examples, it's very easy to see that the left and right cells in J are indexed by uh, their singleton left and right ascent sets. So if you have an element in J, there is a, a unique simple reflection such that you multiply on the left and you end up with a, um, um, in, in something bigger. Uh, so, then after this the next observation is the, the following so if you have your quotient delta e modulo delta x and you have a simple reflection such that sx is smaller than x which is in the descent of x then the circle of this quotient contains some simple such that its index has the opposite properties such that sy is in the s is in the ascent of y sy is bigger than y and a similar thing is true on the other side. 
And again, this is an algebraic statement with a non-trivial algebraic proof using some functorial actions on category O. But this, so these observations, they have combinatorial consequences. And the combinatorial consequences, so these observations, they direct us into the combinatorial world of Bigrassmannian permutations. So on the previous slide, we defined the notions of ascent, left and right. So there are, of course, the similar notions of descent. So the left descent is a simple reflections which make your permutation smaller when you multiply on the left. And the right descent are simple reflections which make your permutation smaller when you multiply on the right. And the permutation is called by Grassmannian, provided that both the left descent set of this permutation and the right descent set are singletons, contain exactly one element. And from the discussion in the previous slide, we can immediately conclude that if we have a, an element in W, such that the quotient which we are interested in, delta E modulo delta W has simple socle, then W must be by Grassmannian. So the point is that if you look at this next observation, if you have two elements in the left descent, then you must have at least two different samples in the circle and similarly for the right descent. So this is the corollary. In our quotient, if we would like to have a chance to have a simple circle, we must look at a by Grassmannian permutation W. And also the small combinatorial observation by Grassmannian permutations are exactly the joint irreducible elements with respect to the Brihat order. I will not use it today, but uh, it's important if you want to think, try to think about this problem for other types. For other types, it's really the joint irreducibility, which is important and not the properties that it's by Grassmannian. In other types, these, these are different usually. <clears throat> okay, so here is an SL3 example of the whole story. So we take SL3, the, uh, the while group is S3, so it has elements E and then two simple reflections S and T and remaining elements S, T, T, S and W0. And the by Grassmannian permutations are here in magenta color. So these are S, T, S, T and T, S. So the Levy structure of Verma modules in this case are as follows. So here it is in, in this picture. So this is a multiplicity one case. So all structure is purely given by the, uh, by the combinatorics of the Bruja order on the W. So the, the dominant Verma module has E on top, and then on the next level, you have S and T simples, and then ST and TS simples, and W0 is a simple circle. And uh, delta S is a submodule of delta E uniquely, delta T is a submodule of delta E uniquely, delta st, delta ts, and delta w0 is a simple verma model. And now, so these are my verma modules. Now I look at the co-kernel of the inclusion in delta e. And here is what you get. So if you take delta e and include in itself, of course the co-kernel is zero. So there is nothing in the co-kernel. If you take delta S and embed into delta E, so this is a delta S, it's in gray here, and the co-kernel is E and T, and you, we have T as a simple circle. So similarly for T, if you embed T, the co-kernel will have simple circle S. If you embed ST, the co-kernel will have simple circle TS. If you embed delta TS, the co-kernel will have simple circle ST. And if you embed W0, the co-kernel will have both TS and ST in the circle. So if you make this comparison, you immediately see that in this particular example, the co-kernel has simple circle if and only if the permutation which you factor out is a by Grassmannian permutation. And so this is an observation and later on we will formulate it as the first main result. Okay, but in order to be able to formulate it, I need uh, to give some a little bit extra motivation. So we also need to prove or to understand why this might be the case. 
So for this, what you really need, you need to look at Kajdan-Lustig polynomials for the penultimate cell. You need to look at Kajdan-Lustig polynomials between the identity element and elements in the penultimate cell. Because these describe the multiplicities of simple subquotients for, for the element W in the dominant Fermat module delta E. And here is just a computation of them, which you can do on a computer for small ranks. So this is the polynomial for rank one, rank two, rank three, and rank four. And somehow the exercise is to find a pattern. And there is a pattern and it's even better, uh, more visible with some uh, additional observations. So first of all, the length of W0 in these examples is here it is one, here it is three, here it is six, and here it is 10. And I highlighted zero, two, five, and nine, the maximal degrees which, which appear to, to, so that you can spot the connection. And then if you interpret these uh, uh, exponents as the indicators of the degree, so these kajdan polynomials can be arranged in the following picture. So the first picture is not interesting, it's just one point, but then these kajdan polynomials can be arranged in this graded picture. And this represents subquotients of the dominant verma module, which are associated to this penultimate cell. And, and the edges in this diagram correspond to some extensions between simples in the dominant verma module. So, so this picture can be, can be drawn like that. So this picture, the, the rank three picture corresponds to the tetrahedron here and the rank four picture corresponds to the tetrahedron here. So this is an observation which you can make if you just compute the small rank cases. Well, and then, uh, and then of course, after this, you can ask, Will this continue? Will this pattern continue? And the answer is yes. Again, this is a this is now a proof which you can do using kajdan lustig polynomials and kajdan lustig combinatorics. But you can prove that this, that pattern continues. And in particular, if you add up evaluations of all kajdan lustig polynomials between E and elements in the penultimate cell at one, you will get the tetrahedral number which enumerates all the corresponding subquotients in the Verma module, in the dominant Verma module. And then you need one more observation. Uh, if you kind of uh, look at the correct places in the literature, it was not very easy to find, but uh, the, it, was, it is known that by Grassmannian permutations are also enumerated by the same number. And in fact, when you know this, it's very easy to construct them. So by Grassmannian permutations are given as follows. So, so in rank N, so it's on N plus one letters, you pick, a, you pick a, an interval between A and B, and then you pick uh, somewhere a point in that interval, and you take all elements from the beginning of this interval to that point, and you send them to the end of the interval as uh, shown here. And all the other elements to the right of that point are sent to the beginning. So it's like a generalization of the simple reflection. So simple reflection is, of course, a by Grassmannian permutation. And then from this description, it's easy that they, are, that they are enumerated by the same number. And and this is somehow the main observation. As soon as you realize this, then it's not very difficult then to prove our main result. So here is now the main result, uh, part one, about the simplicity of the circle. And uh, just for the terminology which I will use, I will call uh, simple subquotients which corresponds to the elements in the penultimate cell, penultimate subquotients for simplicity. So the main theorem, part one, assume that W is a permutation and assume that you are interested in the quotient of delta E modulo delta W. So this quotient has simple Sokol if and only if your permutation is by Grassmannian. This is claim number one, but it's, it gets much better. The claim number two 
is that the correspondence, when you take a by Grassmannian permutation and map it to the socle of this quotient, so this correspondence induces a bijection between the set of all by Grassmannian permutations in SM and the set of all penultimate subquotients of delta E. And what is important for this theorem is that by Grassmannian permutations, if you, uh, by Grassmannian, each by Grassmannian permutation has singleton left descent and singleton right descent. So if you fix the left descent and the right descent of the by Grassmannian permutation, then you will have a collection of by Grassmannian permutations with this fixed left and right descent and they form a chain with respect to the Bruja order. And then they all correspond to the same simple penultimate module because it's a unique element in the penultimate cell with the corresponding fixed right ascent and the fixed left ascent. So it's the same simple subquotient, but as a subquotient of delta E, this simple can appear in different degrees. And this is exactly these degrees correspond different degrees correspond to different elements in this chain of all by Grassmannian permutations with this fixed left descent and right descent. So this is the bijection, the, uh, the first main statement of the talk. So this was about the by Grassmannian permutations and now what about all permutations? So the general case is given then by the following theorem. So this is a main result part two. Now take any element in SN and look at the socle of delta E modulo delta W. So the claim is that the socle constituents of this quotient correspond under the bijection from the previous part, from part one, exactly to the Bruja maximal by Grassmannian elements in the set of all elements in W that are Bruja smaller than or equal to W. So you take W, you take all Bruja smaller elements. This is usually called the ideal of the partial order or co-ideal, one of them. And in that set, you look at the maximal by Grassmannian elements. And this exactly correspond you to the socle of this quotient. And the correspondence is given by the previous, by the part one of the theorem. So in particular, so in particular, coming back to our original aim. So if you have two elements in the, in the symmetric group, such that the first of one of them is not the longest element, then, the dimension of the x1 from the simple module Lx to delta w is at most one. Moreover, it is exactly one if and only if x corresponds to a or is a Bruja maximal. Sorry, <clears throat> if and only if x corresponds under the bijection from the previous slide to a Bruja maximal by Grassmannian element in the set of all elements which are Bruja smaller or equal to W. So this is an explicit combinatorial description of when you have a non-zero X from a simple module to a Verma module under the assumptions that your simple module is not a Verma module. So this is the answer to the original question. <clears throat> okay, uh, good. And now, um, so now I want to go further in the direction of describing the additional combinatorial properties of this thing. So, uh, so the rest of the talk is combinatorial description of the part two of main theorem in, in, in kind of nicer combinatorial terms. So I'm interested to just describe the set of all Bruja maximal by Grassmannian elements in the set of all Bruja smaller than or of all elements which are Bruja smaller than or equal to W. And this is now kind of looking at the literature and uh, finding the correct results. So for this, I want to talk about the essential set of a permutation. And this is something which I believe the notion is due to Fulton. 
and I, I will define what it is uh, just on examples. So I will give you examples of the essential sets for, for these two permutations. Okay. Uh, so what you do, we take a permutation and we write a graph of this permutation. And uh, so here we are following Fulton. So the, the, the first points are written here, one, two, three, four, five, and then the, the outcomes are written here. So one goes to five. So this is one goes to five, two goes to two, three goes to four, four goes to one, and five goes to three. And then you do something. Uh, so for each element in the graph, you take out uh, the ray, which starts at this element and goes down, and the ray which starts at this element and goes to the right. So this is a little bit similar to uh, this um, Viennot's shadows construction, but it is not it. You don't get, you don't take away the whole area. You just take away the rays. So you start from a point. You take away the ray down to the point and the ray to the right. So if you do this, what what remains is uh, uh, is shown by this small x. So the remaining points are these small x's. And out of these points, the essential set is the collection of these small x points such that they have nothing to the right. There is no x to the right and there is no x below it. So they are in small boxes. So the, the x's which are in boxes have no x to the right and no x directly below it. So this point has an x two steps on the right, but this is allowed. So you shouldn't have x immediately to the right, and you shouldn't have an x immediately below. So the essential set of the first permutation consists of three elements. And the essential set of the second permutation, if you do the same kind of uh, combinatorial manipulation, it consists of two elements. OK, so this is the definition of the essential set of a permutation. Great. And now the point is that you can describe Sokols using essential sets if you kind of find the corresponding correct, uh, correct uh, related results in the literature. So for W and SN, just for notational convenience, let, denote, let us denote by BMW, the set of all by Grassmannian elements, which are Bruja maximal in the set of, uh, in the ideal of W with respect to the Bricha order in the set of all elements which are smaller than or equal to W in the Bricha order. And then the, there is a statement, uh, there is a theorem due to Kobayashi from 2010, which says that BMW is in bijection with the essential set of W and the bijection is given in the following way. So if you take an element X, in BMW and you map it to the right descent, left descent to this pair, you will get exactly an element in the essential set of W. So from this statement, we have a combinatorial description of the Sokol. So if you have W in SN and you factor out Delta W from the dominant Verma module, then the Sokol constituents of this module are in the bijection with the essential set of W. So the bijection is given by combining the Kobayashi bijection with our bijection from the uh, first part of the main theorem. <clears throat> and note that this is an uh, ungraded version. Uh, so, so in this description, there are no kind of difference between, so if you fix an element, it can all be placed in one position. But the point is that you can even do it better. You can also trace the graded version of this theorem. But for this, you need to introduce the notion of a rank function, which is also due to Fulton from the same paper when he talked about the essential sets. So Fulton's rank function for W in SN, it is defined in the following way. So the rank of the point IJ is a number of all k which is smaller than or equal to i such that w of k is smaller than or equal to j and for our purposes it's better to 
use the what we call the Korenk function. So this is the uh, function defined as follows. You take the minimum of i and j and you sub subtract the rank function. And here is the combinatorial description, maybe with an example immediately of this thing. So the rank function, if you look at the picture, which we use to define the to define the essential set, then the rank function evaluated at some point ij of this picture is the number of elements in the graph of our permutation, which are to the northwest. So which are in the corner if you go up or to the left in that quadrant from ij. And then our core rank function is described as the so since we take here the minimum of i and j. So if you if i is smaller than j, that this is the number of our graph elements to the northeast. And if i is greater than j, then this is the number of our elements to the southwest. And for the in our two examples where we had the essential sets. So these are the values of, of our core rank function. Okay, so you can just directly combinatorially compute them from the, uh, from the uh, graphs of the elements. And then using this rank function, we can make finer the combinatorial description of Sokol's via essential sets. So we can explicitly point out what would be the graded shift of the corresponding Sokol constituents. So if we denote by Wij the unique penultimate element whose left ascent is ii plus one and right ascent is jj plus one, then the graded Sokol of this quotient, so this quotient is always uniquely defined, so this graded shift is unique. So the Sokol of delta E divided by delta w gradedly shifted by minus lw is given as the following thing. So we should go through the essential set. For each element in the essential set, there is a unique simple constituent in the Sokol, which corresponds to that essential set. And the graded shift of that constituent of that simple element is given by this formula, where the correct current function plays a role. So it's some linear combination of some stuff using the parent function. So, <clears throat> and uh, so, so this is the more combinatorially, combinatorially finer version of the original results. So using stand, uh, what is already known about combinatorics of Bigrassmannian permutations, we can give very explicit formulas for, for our original problem. And to end with, uh, here are some pictures. So you can write programs which explicitly compute you those Sokols. So in particular for SL4, so this is a case N is equal to four. And I took three examples where W uh, is the list of these three elements. So S1, S2, S1 corresponds to this picture. S1, S2, S3, so this is a Bigrassmannian element, this corresponds to this picture, and S2, S3, S1, this corresponds to this picture. So the non-dashed things on the picture are the penultimate subquotient, simple subquotients of the dominant Verma module which survive in the quotient, and the red components correspond to the Sokol. So these are the Sokol constituents. Then you take the quotient by S1, S2, S1. So this is a unique Sokol for this by, for the quotient corresponding to this by Grassmannian permutation. And these are the two Sokols corresponding to this permutation. So you can do kind of nice computer computations to illustrate all this. Okay, thank you very much. This is what I wanted to say. <clears throat> Thank you, Walter. Let's uh, just unmute our mics and thank Walter for this nice talk. Um, so if, if you have any questions, please just uh, feel free to unmute your mic and ask directly. Any questions?
so i have a maybe a somewhat naive uh, question so uh, so you said all of this is for this o sub 0 right yes so uh, so does it make sense to replace zero by other uh, lambdas and yes uh, yes uh, in, in for for as i, I just I, i took o zero for simplicity of uh, statements so you can completely we have a complete answer for sln for all blocks there are several reduction statements for category o so if uh, uh, if Uh, you can replace zero by any dominant weight lambda uh, and if it's dominant and regular then the corresponding block is equivalent to o0 so the results just transfer immediately but if the weight is singular then uh, then you have to work a little bit but again there are some functors which connect the regular blocks and singular blocks and using those functors you can transfer all the information from the regular blocks and get a similar results for the singular blocks so so yeah, like i mean it, is there a notion of uh, these by grassmannian permutations and so on uh, so i mean do you have to work with uh, like w well, multi w lambda well, something or? well the, the the simple objects in singular blocks they are indexed by, by certain cosets you have your while group and and um Uh, and uh, you have a parabolic subgroup and you consider some cosets and then uh, and then you have to pay attention to which by grassmannian permutations will survive when you go to the uh, uh, to the wall and so on so the the formulation will be more cumbersome but it's possible to do this and we have it in in, in the paper which is on the archive we have the full answer for singular blocks as well Yes. and uh, so just on a purely combinatorial level is the enumeration of the so like you say with this uh, you know cosets of these parabolic subgroups so uh, can you actually en enumerate the by grassmannian permutations in in these cosets as well i mean you gave a formula for the uh, well uh, i i don't know whether so so for parabolic subgroups you have cosets i don't know whether the notion by grassmannian uh, makes much sense there you you certainly can try to enumerate enumerate joint irreducible elements ah, okay okay but okay. Uh, we, di we 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 didn't think even about this because uh, so we 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 simply transfer all information it can be transferred from the regular situation so we didn't think about that question what exactly what kind of elements correspond so they are images under certain functor of by grassmannian from the regular blocks which satisfies some conditions and that was good enough for us but but uh, it, it's it's a completely uh, legitimate question what is the number of um, say join irreducible elements for some quotient of w with respect to some parabolic subgroup and for the bruha order i don't know the answer but most probably uh, i mean it's a good good thing to think about okay thanks um any other questions um it, yes, it seems like there are no more questions uh, let's thank walter once again thank you very much Thank you.